Well, hi, I'm John Hart, and welcome back to Mr. America Hart. All right, today we have a special guest coming on the channel. I interviewed three-time Mr. Olympia, Frank Zane. And for those of you who are not familiar with him, I know that uh, a lot of the, my subscribers, I should say, about half of my channel subscribers are all under the age of 35. And so your exposure to Frank Zane may be a little bit less than the other half above 35. So <clears throat> everybody from age 24 to 35 that's into bodybuilding, uh, they recognize the current Mr. Olympia usually, and they recognize the current men's physique champion and the classic bodybuilding Mr. Olympia. But back in the day, in 1977, 78, 79, we had Mr. Olympia, and that was it. It was bodybuilding. And so Frank Zane dominated at a time where we had, I mean, monsters, big guys, and he was not a big guy. He changed the entire landscape of bodybuilding for, oh, a solid five, six years, uh, just everything poof, came to a stop after the Arnold era, and it just was about aesthetics. So we had a little preview of what was to come as in today's classic bodybuilding. So here you go, Frank Zane coming at you. Well, all right, Frank, how are you? I'm just fine, thank you. All right, today we have uh, on Mr. America Heart, we have as a guest, Three time Mr. Olympia and I, I, a lifelong bodybuilder, right? Frank Zane. Pretty much, pretty much. Right. And Frank, you, you over the years, you've been quite the teacher uh, from, you know, I, I would say when you were in your professional years straight through until today, yes? Well, I taught school uh, up until 1977, uh, mostly high school, junior high school. I taught mathematics. And in 1977, when I won the Olympia for the first time, I retired from that. And you're known, just for some of the listeners and, and viewers that we have on my channel, uh, I have quite the group of subscribers, all ages from age 24. The majority of my subscribers are from age 24 to 64. And they're evenly distributed throughout that age range. Uh, and a lot of the younger ones who may not know, uh, but currently are very interested in aesthetics and the current trends in bodybuilding, not just hardcore bodybuilding, bodybuilding, but also physique, uh, as well as uh, classic bodybuilding. They may not know that you, in fact, were known as one of the most aesthetic physiques in all of bodybuilding, right? Well, I figured that was my best shot at, you know, being on top was to go that that uh, direction because I had a very small bone structure and I could never be big and impressive. I mean, I could never weigh even 200 pounds. So I stayed right around 190 and uh, made the best of that. How tall are you, Frank? I'm five foot nine. So 5'9 and 190 was your best competitive weight? Yes. Okay. So in the, in the early, let's jump all the way back to the earliest years. How did you start training? Well, um, I was in northeastern Pennsylvania, and I trained at the YMCA, some at home with some dumbbells, and then at a, a local uh, bodybuilder's gym that we would go to. And uh, that, that made up for all of it. And uh, that was in the 1960s. And then in 1969, I believe, I moved to California, settled in Santa Monica, and uh, started training at Gold's Gym. So you were in your early 20s when you started training for the first time, or how old were you? Well, I was 14, actually. Yeah, that's, that would be... By, by the way, happy belated birthday. Did you have a birthday recently? June 28th. Yes, happy belated birthday. Uh, 81? You were born in 81, 20th? yeah. Yes, congratulations. Awesome. So you were 14 when you started training. And when you took, before you took the move to California, what type of work did you do? I taught school. Oh, so you were teaching even before coming out here. Yes. My first year, I think it was 1964 to 65, 
I taught in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, was a math teacher. The next year I taught in New Jersey. I taught math and earth science. Then I taught three years in Florida, mostly mathematics, and then uh, moved to uh, Los Angeles and taught uh, mathematics for eight years. And then uh, won the Olympia and retired. Took a sabbatical leave actually, trained full time and then won the Olympia and never went back. Wow, wow. So how many years did you train before your very first contest? Hmm. Four or five. And I've seen some older pictures of you from back in the day. And that bone structure, of course, was there. And the shape was there. But back in that day, was it, in your mind, was it a big attempt to get as big as possible, like most young men at that time? Well, maybe at first it was, but I realized that wasn't my path to, to the top. And uh, I had some compliments along the way. I remember at one contest, might even have been my first competition. It was in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, which is near Allentown. Bob Hoffman, the father of American weightlifting, came over to me and he said, young man, if I had a physique like yours, I'd walk around with my shirt off all the time. And wow. so I was very enamored by that compliment. You know, it motivated me. I kept going. Wow. 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 So how many days a week do you recall? I, I know that you're a great record keeper. Uh, I've, I've followed you for the most of the last 40 years. And I've had most of your writings. I've, you know, whether it's been through Iron Man magazine or your books, your newsletters, I've, I've had a lot of those things and bought most of them myself. Uh, so yes, you can say I have done the fanboy thing for you. Uh, and so I'm pretty familiar with a lot of your writings along the way. What sort of routine during those first four years or so prior to working out did you do? Prior to I'm not sure. I'm not sure the first one was probably upper body one day and lower body the next day. Hmm. Six days a week, training like that. Wow. And then I got into a three-way split where it was uh, pulling muscles the first day, legs the second day, pushing muscles the third day, abs every day, a, a little aerobics every day, rest fourth day. It was a four-day cycle, and that's the one I did most of. So when you came out to California... Did your training, I, you know, I, I take it from some of the things you've been, I've watched some of your interviews as well prior to this, that you were friends with Arnold, you trained with a few of the boys at Gold's Gym and hung out with them as well at that time. Did your training take a major change just by relocating to here, to Southern California? Not really, but you know, everybody that trained at Gold's Gym in those days did the same routine. Hmm. I think it was something like a, chest and back the first day, legs the second day, delts and arms the third day. That's what everybody did pretty much. I did that. Right. And so when you were training at that time, did, you, your professional career or the Olympia years, I have them down as your first Olympia was in 1972. Does that sound correct? I think that was the first year I went in the Olympia, 72. Right. Right. So from 72 to 83, with the exception of uh, 1981, right, for the Franco year, you were in the Olympia all those years? Let's see, pretty much, uh, I think 70, 72 was first year, 74 the second, 75 the third, 76, 77, 78, 79, thereafter, uh, 80. I did. I was also there in Australia, and then eighty-two and eighty-three. So, so a lot of so years. A lot of years. I, that was my comment. I was going to go, man. I mean, you you're pulling an eleven-year time span where you competed nine out of those eleven. It sounds like in, in the Olympia, right? Yeah, just about. And so during those years, now this is just me personally. I've judged a lot of shows, okay, and. In, in in the last 25 years or so and to me i've just looked at your pictures from each of those years and i really liked your 1976 and 1979 physiques the best for slightly different reasons but 
I liked, I think in 76, it seemed like you really pulled it together, shape, size, symmetry, and definition wise. And then in 1979, it looked like that was another peak in my opinion. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I'd have to go along with that. I was in great shape in 76. And, uh, you know, Colombo won it that year, but there was a lot of controversy that I should have won. And, you know, when people say you should have won, you generally do win thereafter. So 77, I, I won it the first time. Right. And then now, two years subsequently. So now Franco in 76, by the pictures that I've seen, of course, you know, Franco, phenomenal chest, phenomenal back, amazing <laughs> thickness and strength. Uh, as a judge, I'm saying this as a judge now, okay? <laughs> uh, as a physique judge, I saw a lot of weaknesses. I saw a lot in his lower body. Uh, this is prior to his big leg injury and smooth in the quads, smooth in the hamstrings. Uh, uh, his arms weren't in proportion to his torso. And yet I saw you standing next to him and I, in those pictures, I go, hey, every single pose, this is a complete physique right here. That was my impression. Well, I thought so too, but I wasn't a judge. So, right. you know, I just stuck with it and uh, kept going. So that also brings something up. So you had the mindset after losing that Olympia when a lot of people said it should have been yours. You still kept going and you had that drive. And I, the one thing I've noticed about your career and as an example to all other bodybuilders, but let's just say just as an example, OK, you've really done a great job of garnering or taking control of your mind more than anything else. The mental aspect that I've noticed, at least in following you, is that it really interested me to to ask, have you always been that way? And when you did lose a contest such as that, did you take long to get over it or was it more of a. Like you've m mentioned in other interviews, you had a mantra that you would say, and your mantra, did you go straight back to mental training, mantra, you know, discipline, all of that? Or was it more, you gave yourself, you allowed yourself a minute to get over this, and if you were upset for a while, you were upset for a while? Well, I always kept with the mantra. And, you know, like a few months after the show, I was a little bit, disheartened by not winning but then I realized the advantage of not winning is I still had the same game plan I mm -hmm. didn't have to totally reinvent my strategy and so that was an advantage and then I just picked up where I left off and, and you seem like the, yeah and you seem like the type of uh, individual that you didn't necessarily study so much your competitors right it was more about you focusing in on you is that correct yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's it. That was it. And prior to, you know, we us doing this interview, I shared with you a little bit about how I was friends with Mike Menser, who took second place to you in the Mr. Olympia in 1979. And he didn't take that well. Right? <laughs> and he didn't take losing in 1980 well either. And it's obvious. I, I've, I've done a video recently where I shared with my subscribers these catalogs or these uh, encyclopedia sets of old Iron Man magazines that Mike kept, and he, you know, was given to me after his death. And I have an entire set of these things. And when I've read through them, he's highlighted and underlined so many parts of it where you are, and he did so for years prior to ever competing against you. And so I found it quite interesting that his reaction to losing a contest was quite different than yours. You know, he focused in on his competitors, but rather you focused in on you being the best that you could be, right? I'd say that's accurate, yeah. Yes, and so you kept great diaries over the years, is that correct? I did, I wrote down everything. Which one of your, your books, I remember there was a book a while back, was it the Zane Diaries that you had that it, it literally followed all of your it shared all of your entries from a bunch of your diaries i think the most complete one is this one the zane That's bodybuilding it. manual 436 pages pretty much everything that i know about bodybuilding i call that the textbook and then i have another one called 
91 Day Wonder Body, which was yeah. a workbook. It's three months of what to do every day. And so I, I had pride as a teacher and I wanted to put material out there that people can follow. And that's what the 91 Day Wonder Body is. One is a textbook that has all the information about my career and what I did. And then the other one is how you can do it now. That's awesome. Where, where can we find this material, Frank? It's on my website. FrankZane.com. Frank yeah. Yes, FrankZane.com. I'll put links down below in the video description for anybody who wants to see them. So uh, at any point, were you friends with Mike Mensor? He mentioned you guys as friends at one point. Yeah, yeah. Afterwards, we were friends. We had him over for dinner. I remember Palm Springs. He came over and we had some steak and he said he doesn't never eat steak, but he ate it when he came over and uh, we were friendly. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, it, he spoke actually quite highly of you as an individual. Uh, I was friends with him. He trained me. And then we actually lived on the same block. And you don't know this about me personally, I, I don't think, but uh you know, I won a lot of the same titles, but in the natural realm, in natural bodybuilding, the natural Mr. Universe, and also the actual Mr. America that you won, that Mike Menser won, the title at one point went to a natural organization between 2011 and 2013. And I won that in 2013. So it's a real honor to get to speak to you. And it's also been friends with a lot of other former Mr. Americas. And so I, I, I honor that. And, uh, and so it makes me ask questions sort of like when you were friends with Mike, his training style was quite different than yours. Yes. It was, but it didn't affect how I trained. You know, he was all about minimal sets and going to failure. And I never did that. I was more of what you might call old, older school. It's pretty much what Arnold did, what we all did at Gold's Gym at the time, multiple sets, like, three, four, five sets of each exercise. And, and that would be after warm-ups, right? No, that was it. Yeah. First set right. was like warm-up. Then we just increased the weight each set. Right. Got you. Got you. Would you take sets to failure when you were trained? No, I never trained to failure. Wow. I wow. always took it to my last successful rep. Yeah. So the form would just start to break slightly, yes? Well, it was the last rep I could do in good form. Right, right. <clears throat> and so um, as you went over the years from your last Olympia, you were 41, 42? 41. Okay. So you retired 41. You haven't been on stage now in 40 years exactly. So how did your training, you're still a young man at 41, right? Yeah. So your training at that time, I assume, was still about the same as you just described, yes? I could have kept going, but I had some injuries, and I was concerned about them getting worse. And I figured that I did the best I could in that time frame. And I really wanted to focus more on teaching rather than competitive training, because I felt like I've already done that. Right. So at that point in time, when you're 41, you find yourself stepping off stage you're going to go and you're going to do your own workouts now without an eye on competition did the workouts change of course they train they changed i didn't train as intensely but i still did them on a regular basis you know i, I still worked out seriously but i also had a lot of work commentary for the contest you know on cbs abc and nbc wide world of sports I had all those jobs as a commentator, so it worked out well. Right. You're, you're quite articulate, so I could see how that would be. And then also, um, over the years, after the competition days are over with, did you find that you still use the same pattern? One of the things that I borrowed from you is that you talked about how you would train seasonally with an eye on peaking in the fall, correct? Yeah. I still so, do that relatively speaking. That's what I was I don't, after. I don't, go all, I don't go all out on anything anymore. I'd say probably reach my best overall condition in the autumn every year. And that's what I shoot for. Right. Then I take it easy over the holidays and then sort of start up again. Uh, I, I work, start working on my weak points in the early, early springtime 
I asked myself what could be better in relation to everything else, and I would focus more on that. And my training has always pretty much gone like that. So, so for sure, that I've modeled my own training and lifestyle. That's the thing that I really got from your teaching on that pattern is that it's a lifestyle. It actually enables anybody who's working out to not burn out because you're yeah. taking, right? So if you're in it on the long game, it only makes sense, right? That you would want to sort of, I, I see it as a sine wave in mathematics, right? A sine wave, meaning, you know, you know what it means. And then sure. <laughs> my talking to, and so doing a sine wave of effort and mounting it up for the fall, as in you just described in the autumn, I would do the same thing. And I found it to be, now that I'm also getting on 39 years of training, that I don't have major injuries. And at the time, I remember your injuries during your Olympia years, they weren't exactly from training, were they? Not so much, you know, I had some bike, uh, cycling injuries, shoulder stuff, but I managed to overcome and train around them. Right. Not aggravate them, get therapy. You know, I did a lot of therapy. Right, but, you're, but the injuries that you had were never coming from the training itself. No. Okay. So that's important because I really am interested for myself, for my subscribers, and for anybody who's watching this in the future, that, that your efforts and your training, this is where a lot of guys miss it. They go to the gym, they blast away all year round with no real goal in mind, and they don't know how to temper it for part of the year with an eye for peaking. And I've always admired power lifters because they do use peaking techniques to be the strongest they can on a certain date, right? I learned a lot from power lifters. Mm -hmm. I hung out with some of them in the, you know, the late seventies and I, I picked up a lot of tips. Right. Those guys, they, I have had guys and girls, female power lifters as well. To share with me some of their cycles of how they would train and i use those as well so i've taken a little bit from different groups whether it was mike menser for some training you for some of the the overall perspective on a year's worth of training and then the power lifters as well because uh a lot of them that i knew didn't have injuries those are the people i've been most interested in so if you had to take somebody right now from a beginning standpoint, would you have them train full body workouts three times a week and just re relentlessly train to gain mass at first? Oh, I don't know. Maybe either that or two way split. <clears throat> Probably a two way split upper body one day, legs the next day, rest the third. I like that a lot. I like that a lot as well. Over the years, have you helped competitors to get into shape? Yeah. And well, so yesterday, you... yesterday, Robbie Robinson and Michael Hearn were here. And we went over a lot of stuff. We didn't train very much. We just talked about a lot of the issues. Right. And we shot archery right. for a while. And they, they enjoyed that. <laughs> so, so do a lot of competitors still consult with you? No. Mm. No, not a lot, but some do. Wow, some of that is their loss right there. I mean, I find it. Well, it's up to them, you know. They have their own aesthetic and how they want to do it. And they, a lot of them think that they know everything. But, you know, if you think that, you don't. Right. You could always learn from somebody who's already done it. So The moment, the moment you say you know it, you don't. <laughs> you certainly don't. I hope you enjoyed this interview with three-time Mr. Olympia, Frank Zane. I have included down below in the video description of this video a link to part two of this interview. We cover a lot of material in part two and it's hitting hard and fast. And I'll also include a link to Frank Zane's website wherein you can buy his books and any of his writings.